The Mastermind, Chapter 2 The Mind Master The idea of mastery inevitably carries with it the notion of dominion, power, or supremacy exercised by some person or team which is regarded as the master. The spirit and essence of the term master is that of governor, ruler, director, leader, manager, or controller. In short, the essential meaning of the two terms master and mastery respectively is bound up with the idea of government. To govern anything, the governing authority regulates, directs, restrains, manages, encourages, and exercises general control and direction. In all forms of government, there is to be found a certain central point of authority, a certain central power which is sovereign within its own realm and which has the authority to promulgate commands and the authority to enforce them. Whether the government is that exercised by the chief of a savage tribe who gains and holds his position by means of physical strength, whether be that of the monarch of a kingdom who gains and holds his position by hereditary right, or whether it be that of the president of a republic who gains and holds his position by the will of the people. The central authority is vested in some one particular individual, and descending in the scale will find the same principle in operation and force in government of a public meeting a schoolroom, a workshop, or an office. In short, wherever there is government, there must be a central governing authority, a master. The above general principle being recognized, the reasoning mind at once applies it to the question of the operation and government of the mental powers and faculties. If the mind is held to be governed at all, to be capable of government, then there must be some central governing authority, some mind master, whose authority, when exercised, is recognized and obeyed by the other mental units, powers, faculties, or forces. This being so, the reasoning investigator then naturally proceeds to the discovery of this mind master. Let us play the part of this reasoning investigator and proceed with him to the discovery of the mind master, the central point of authority and power in the kingdom of mind. Some psychologists would have, would have us believe that the intellectual faculties are the governing powers of the mind, but it will take but little thought to inform us that in many cases, the intellectual power are not the masterful forces in the mental activities of the individual. For in many cases, the feelings, desires, and emotional factors of the person run away with his reason and not only cause him to do things which his reasons tell him that he should not do, but also so influence his reason that his reasons are usually merely excuses to his actions performed in response to his feelings and emotions. Other psychologists would have us believe that the desires, feelings and emotions of the individual are his mental master and in many cases it will appear that this is true for many persons allow their feelings, emotions and passions to govern them almost entirely or else being subordinated to this. But when we begin to examine closely into the matter, we find that in the case of certain individuals, there is a greater or less subordination of the feelings and emotions to, to the dictates of reason. And in the case of persons of excellent self-control, the reason would appear to be higher in authority than the feelings. And in the case of recognized mental masters, it is even found that the very feelings, 
passions and emotions are so obedient to higher mental authority that in many cases they may actually be transformed and transmuted into other forms of feelings and emotions in response to the orders or commands of the central authority. The reasoning investigator usually discovers that the mind master is not to be found in the respective realms of the first two of the three great divisions of the mental kingdom, that is, in the division of thought, or that of feeling, respectively. The investigator then turns to the third great division of the mental kingdom, that is, that of will, in his search for the sovereign power, and at first it will appear that here in the region of the will, he had found the object of the search and that the will must be acclaimed the master but when the matter is gone into the into a little deeper the investigator discovers that not in will itself but in a something lying at the very center of will is to be found the mind master while it is seen that the will is higher in power and authority than either thought or feeling yet it is also seen by careful investigator that in most cases the will is controlled and brought into activity by the feelings and that in other cases it is started into action by the result of thought or intellectual effort this being so the will cannot be considered as being always the mind master and discovering this the investigator at first begins to feel discouraged and to imagine that he is but traveling around a circle in fact many think i would have would always believe that the mental processes walk around in a circle and that like a ring the process has no point of beginning or point of ending but those who have persisted in the search have been rewarded by a higher discovery. They have found that while many persons are impelled to will by reason of their feelings and emotions and others by reason of their thoughts, there is a third class of individuals, a smaller class, to be sure, who seems to be masters of the will activity and who standing in the position of a judge and sovereign power first carefully weigh the merits of both feelings and thoughts and then decide to exercise the real power in a certain determined direction and then actually to exert that power. This last class of individuals may be said to really will to will by the ex by the exercise of some higher authority found within themselves these men are the real masterminds let us seek to discover the secret of their power the central authority there is in the mental realm of every individual a certain something which occupies the position of central authority power and control over the entire mental kingdom of that person in many cases in most cases we regret to say this something seems to be asleep and the kingdom is allowed to run itself higgly piggly automatically and like a piece of senseless machinery or else under the control of outside mentalities and personalities in other cases, in many cases, in fact, this central authority has partially awakened and consequently exerts at least a measure of its authority over its kingdom, but at the same time fails to realize its full power or to exert its full authority. It acts like a man only half awakened from a sleep and still in a state of partial doze. Rising in the scale, we find cases of still greater degree of awakening 
until finally we discovered the third great class of individuals, a very small class, alas, in whom the central authority has become almost or quite fully awake, and in whom this mind master has taken active control of his kingdom and has begun to assert his authority and power over it. The first class is composed of the masses of the people. The second class is composed of those who occupy positions and places of more or less authority and power in the world's affairs. And the third class is composed of those exceptional individuals who are the natural rulers of the destinies of the race and directors of its activities, the real mastermind. There is only one way of aiding the investigator to discover this something, this central authority, this mind master. That one way consists of directing the investigator to turn his perception inward and to take stock of his numerous mental faculties, powers, activities and bits of mechanism and to then set aside as merely incidental and subordinate all that appears to be so. When all these have been set aside in the process of elimination, then there will be found a something which is left after the process and which absolutely refuses to be set aside as merely incidental and subordinate and that something is then perceived to be the central authority or mind master, even though it be half asleep and unconscious of its great powers. But for that matter, no mind master which is deeply wrapped in slumber will ever discover itself, for it must have been at least partially awakened in order one to have thought of the matter at all or to be capable of thought on the subject and two to have power of attention and application in necessary necessary to pursue the investigation so good readers or good listeners if you have the desire to find the mind master which is yourself it is a sign that you have at least partially awaken and if you have the determination to pursue the search it is a sign that you are still for the awaken so you are justified in feeling the courage and the certainty of attainment necessary for the successful termination of the search for the mind master the something within yourself you the personnel listening to this words you yourself are now to ask are now asked to make the search of your mental kingdom the search which has for its aim the discovery of something within yourself which is the mind master and which when fully aroused into conscious power and activity makes you a mastermind the writer will stand by your side during the search and will point out to you at each stage of the search the essential points thereof you will not be asked to accept any metaphysical theories or religious dogmas the search will be confined to strictly psychological fields and will proceed along strictly scientific lines you will not be asked to accept authority of anyone else in the matter. Your own consciousness will be the cut of last appeal. And in the case, the mental analysis. Let us begin with your sensations or reports of your senses. You are constantly receiving reports of one or more of your five senses vis a vis the respective senses of touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. 
All these reports are in the form and nature of impressions received from the outside world. All that we know of this outside world is made known to us by means of these impressions received through the senses. A writer has said, These senses are the means by which the mind obtains its knowledge of the outside world. Shut out from all direct communications, with the outer world. It knows and can know nothing of what exists or is passing there except what comes through the senses. Its knowledge of what is external to itself is therefore dependent upon the number, state and condition of the sensory organs. But important as are the five senses and their mechanism, we need but a little thought to convince us that we do not find here the essential fact and power of mind, but rather merely incidental and subordinate powers. We can easily prove this to ourselves in many ways. For instance, when we shut out or shut up the channel of communication of all of the channels of the senses and still be conscious of our own mental existence. Or we may use the will through the power of attention and thus determine which of the many sets of sense impressions seeking admission to our consciousness we shall really receive and entertain in consciousness. We may thus choose between many sounds or many sights and deliberately shut out the others. If the sense impressions where the masters, where the masters, where the masters, we could not do this. And so long as we are able to do this, we must look for the master higher up in the scale. Moreover, in all of our experience with this, with the sense impressions, we never lose sight of the fact that they are but incidental facts of our mental existence. And that there is something within which is really the subject of the sense report. It's something to which these reports are presented and which receives them. In short, there is always the something which knows or experiences these sensations. We recognize and express this fact when we say, I feel, I see, I hear. There is always the thing sensed, then the process of sensing, and finally, the something which experiences the sensation. This something we speak of as I. The I is always the subject which experiences the sense reports, the something to whom the messages are presented, and as this something is capable of either accepting or selecting and controlling these messages or reports, then the latter cannot be regarded as the mind master. In the same way, we next proceed to the consideration of the emotional phases of our mentality. In this great realm of the mind, we may at least for the purpose of the present inquiry for the present inquiry include all those mental experiences that come under the respective head of feelings, passions, desires, etc. This seem a little closer to us than did the sensations. This because the sensations came from outside of ourselves, while the emotions and feelings seem to come from within a part of ourselves. The emotional part of our nature is very powerful, so powerful indeed that it often seems to rule the entire being of the individual, but a little careful examination will convince us that we may by the use of will, not only refuse to obey our emotional urges and demand, but may even destroy them or replace them with others. 
If our emotions were really masters, we would be bound to act upon them at all times and upon all occasions, for there will be nothing in us to say nay to them. But no one outside of the most primitive and elemental individuals will permit any such role on the part of the emotional nature. Even the less advanced of the race are able to at least partially control and manage emotional parts of their mental nature and the advanced individuals have acquired the power of frequently deliberately setting aside the dictate of the emotions and of asserting the power of control over them. So here too we see that the master must be look, looked for higher up in the scale. As in the case of the sensations, here too in the case of emotions we discover the presence of that something within which the subject of emotions the something to which the emotions report and from whom they demand action. Here again we find this. I, occupying a higher seat and having the reports and demand of the subordinate faculties made upon it. And mark you this, that in spite of the constant change in the emotional stream of feeling, this I always remains the same just as in the case of the sensations the I occupies the position of a spectator to whom are presented the senses experiences so in the case of emotions the I occupies the position of something which experience the ever-changing feeling of the emotional nature in both cases there seems to be this constant something past which flows the respective stream of sensations and emotions. And this something also has the power to direct and change the cause of this stream. If it will but exert its real power. Next, we consider the great realm of thoughts. Here too we find a constant stream of thoughts flowing past the something, the I, which is practically the spectator of the following stream and which also has the power of directing and controlling the stream while it is true that the individuals of primitive natures are almost passive spectators of the streams of their thoughts and exercise little or no control over them. It is an unquestioned fact that other individuals who have cultivated their willpower are able to turn their attention to this kind of thoughts or that kind and thus control and determine just what kind of thoughts they shall think. Every student perform it this feat of control and mastery when he voluntarily directs his attention to some particular study which he desires to master. In fact, all voluntary attention is performed by this exercise of the power of the will exerted by this something within which we call I, and which thus proves itself to be the master of thoughts. The individual who has trained his mind to obey his will is able to direct his thought processes just as he directs his feet or his hand or his body or just as he guides and manages his team or horses or his motor car. This being so, we cannot consider our thought processes or faculties as the mind master but must look for the latter in something still higher in authority. There seem to be put one other region of the mind in which to search for our mind master or central authority. You naturally say here, he means the will. But it is merely the will. But is it merely the will? Stop a moment and consider. If the will in itself is the mind master, why is it that 
the will in the case of so many persons allows itself to be controlled and called into action by ordinary feelings, desires, emotions, or passions, or on the other hand is called into action by the most trifling passing thoughts or idea. In such cases, it will appear that the will is really the obedient, easy servant, rather than the master, does it not. That the machinery of the will is the mechanism of control and action is undoubted, but what is it that controls and directs the will in the case of individuals of strong will power? In such cases, it would seem that not only must the will be strong, but that there must be some stronger something which is able to control, direct and apply the power of the will. In moments in which you have exerted your willpower, did you identify yourself with your will or did you feel that your will has an, was an instrument of power belonging to you and being operated by you? Were you not at such moments aware of feeling an overwhelming consciousness of the existence of yourself or I at the center of your mental being? And of feeling that at least for the time this I was the master of all the rest of your mental equipment. We think that you will agree to the statement if you will carefully live over again the experiences of such moments and in imagination and memory reenact the experience. All mental analysis brings the individual to the realization that. At the very center of his mental being, there abides and dwells a something, and he always calls this I, which is the permanent element of his being. While his sensations, his feelings, his emotions, his taste, his thoughts, his beliefs, his ideas, and even his ideals have changed from time to time. He knows to his certainty that this I has been permanent and that it is the same old I that has always been present during his entire life, from his earliest days. He knows that although his emotional nature and general mental physical character may have undergone an almost total transformation and change, yet this I has never been really changed at all, but has ever remained the same old I. It is as if this I was an individual who had worn many successful coats or shoes or hats, but always remained the same individual. The consciousness of every individual was always re so report to him when the answer is demanded of it. And moreover, while the individual me and thus change his sensations, his feelings, his tastes, his passions, his emotions, and his whole general character in some cases, he is never able to change in the slightest degree. This something within which he calls I, he can never run away from this I, nor can he ever move it from its position. He can never lift his eye by means of his mental bootstrap, nor can his personal shadow run away from this eye of his individuality. He may set a path for consideration each and every one of his mental experiences, his sensations, his thoughts, his feelings, his ideas, and all the rest, but he can never set off from himself, from himself this eye for such inspection, he can know this I only as his self, that something within at the very center of his consciousness, a writer has said of this something within which we call I, we are conscious of something closer to the center than anything else, 
and differing from the other forms in being the only form of consciousness to which we are not passive. This something is the normal consciousness of each of you, yet it is never a part of sensation nor emotion, but on the contrary is capable of dominating both sensations originate outside and inside of the body. Emotions originate inside of the body, but this something is deeper than either and they are both objectives of it. We cannot classify it with anything else. We cannot describe it in terms of any other form of consciousness. We cannot separate ourselves from it. We cannot stand off and examine it. We cannot modify it by anything else. It itself modifies everything within its core. Other forms of consciousness are objective in their relation to it, but it is never objective to them. There is nothing in our consciousness deeper. It underlines and overlies and permeates all other forms. And moreover, what is of immeasurably greater importance, it can, if need be, create them. Another writer has said that I is the thinker, the knower, the feeler, the actor, its states of consciousness are constantly changing different today from those of yesterday and different tomorrow from those of today. But the I itself is always the name, just what this I is, we cannot tell. This riddle has never been solved by any reason of man. So subtle is its essence that it is almost impossible to think of it as something apart from its mental state. All that can be said of it is that it is. Its only, rep its only report of itself is I am. You cannot examine the I by the I. You must have an object for your subject. And if you make the I your object, you have no subject left to examine it. Place the eye under the mental microscope to examine it and lo, you have nothing to look through the glass. There is no eye at the eyepiece of the microscope to examine it. The eye cannot be both ends of the glass at, at the same time. Here, at last, you have found an ultimate something which defines all analysis refinement or separation this something within this eye is that is that entity which in philosophy and metaphysics has been called the ego but such name does nothing in the way of defining it you need not stop to speculate over just what the ego is for you you will never learn this all that you can know is that it is and you know this from the ultimate report of your own consciousness in no way, in no other way for nothing outside of yourself can make you know this otherwise. This ego is the mind master, the central authority of your mind. It is this that is able to master, control, manage, rule regulates and directs all of your mental faculties, energies, powers, forces and mechanism. It is this ego when fully awakened into activity which constitutes the essence of the mind master. Your task is not to try to learn just what the ego is for as has been said you will never know this. Your task is to strive to awaken it into active consciousness so that it may realize its power and begin to employ it. You can awaken it by the proper mental attitude towards it, by the conscious realization of its presence and power. You can gradually cause it to realize its power and to use the same by means of exercising exercises calling into play that power 
this is what willpower really means your will is strong already it does not need strengthening what is needed is that you urge your ego into realizing that it can use your willpower and to teach it to use the same means by the right kind of exercises you must learn to gradually awaken the half sleep giant and set it to work in its own natural field of endeavor and activity in this book the way will be pointed out to you so that you may do this but you will have to actively do the thing after being shown how he will how he will will carefully consider the above statement of truth and will make them a part of his mental armament will have grasped the secret of the mastermind chapter 2 read by Dapo Ibrahim